Uh, hi, everyone. Um, the next talk uh, that we're going to hear now is from Russell Cooper, who will be talking about Canute, the world's first working, refreshable, multi-line braille display. Uh, thanks. Enjoy. Um, for the last uh, four and a half uh, years, I've been working with a, a small team out of uh, the, the back of Bristol Hackspace, um, which we're using as an open workshop. Um, the, the main reason we work out of the Hackspace is to keep costs low because it's a not-for-profit project and um, uh, running on a minimal budget. Uh, the, the, goal of the, the goal of the project is to make a multi-line refreshable braille display. Um, and also to make it affordable. Um, the, the current uh, braille displays um, are very expensive, many, many thousands of pounds, and you only get one line. And the goal of this project is to make it um, for about £440 per unit, uh, and that will be a full page rather than a single line. Um, and the reason we're doing this is because currently there is no multi-line display available on the commercial market at all anywhere that we know of. Uh, there are some that are two lines. Uh, there's, there's one that is, um, I think, four lines, but I think it was from a limited supply. And the lines were very short, so you couldn't get anywhere near a full sentence on it. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, the single lines cost uh, many thousands of pounds. Um, As I'm an engineer on the team, I'm going to play a short video that, that we made a short while ago um, that, in, that, that is from Ed, who runs the project. Uh, and it will then have some Brailleists who are actually using the machines. Um, and you can hear their comments um, about the interaction and, and, and the, the uh, benefit that these machines will make in their lives. And then after that, I'm going to move on to some uh, technical details. Um, and I've forgotten to ask, does everyone know what Braille is? Yeah, is there anyone who doesn't know? All right, cool, that's... that's. There we go. Hello. I'm Ed Rogers, I'm the Director of Bristol Braille Technology and we are working on the Canute. The Canute is a radical new Braille e-reading device, it's like a Kindle for blind people. Uh, it makes digital Braille far more affordable than anything that currently exists on the market uh, by having multi-line Braille, which means that you can, you can see a whole page of Braille and it will cost hundreds of pounds rather than thousands of pounds which the existing models currently cost. Now we want to, um, to take the prototypes that we've already made over the last couple of years, we're on the Mark 9 now, we want to take this prototype and we want to make a, a batch of them and trial them in schools around the UK, in Ireland, maybe in America, and we want to, um, to get the feedback from these schools about how to make the Canute into the perfect device for learning Braille and for literacy in general. Uh, we want the Canute to be a tool which can help reverse the decline in braille usage and therefore increase literacy around the world. So we've been working with the Brailleists. The Brailleists is a community organisation established in 2014 designed to give a voice to blind people so that they can be involved in the creation of their own technology, especially around digital braille. Having an affordable multi-line braille display would be transformative, I think, for braille. Well, multi-line braille would certainly make studying uh, science and technology uh, subjects um, more feasible, I think, for blind students. Uh, take computer programming, for example, being able to review code across multiple lines of braille. I think that would be a very powerful use case for multi-line braille. Great for children in school, you know, they could do maths with, on it and, um, well, you know, they could get hold of material, you know, 
be loaded onto it electronically so that it would be readily available in, in Braille. It's very disempowering to be in a room and to be told, well, all the information you want is on the screen. But that doesn't help a blind person to feel that they're part of the meeting or part of the experience. I use Braille every day of my life. Well, it would, hopefully it would mean that I'd have access to more books. Um, and I can think of practical uses for it, like, uh, for instance, I read in church once a month. And my Braille missile at the moment is 15 volumes. Um, and searching for things in it is a nightmare. Um, so, you know, it would be much quicker if I could load the missile onto something like Canute. Um, same with recipes, I could take it to the kitchen and uh, look up things instead of having to trade something downstairs to my computer to get the Braille stuff I want. Well, for the last two years, um, the uh, developers of Canute, Bristol Braille Technology, have worked closely with the Braillists who are a community of, I think, around about 200 uh, Braille um, enthusiasts. Some of us are Braille readers, some of us teach Braille, uh, some of us are parents of children who read Braille. So uh, Bristol Braille Technology have paid very close attention um, to the needs and the views of that community in the development of Canute. I think very early on in the development of the Canute, um, blind people were involved. Um, I certainly remember Ed contacting me and saying he needed to uh, involve vision impaired people in, in testing and giving feedback and uh, generally um, being uh, involved at every stage of the development. We told them what we wanted in terms of the, the number of lines, the length of the characters, and they've gone away and tried to build this, you know, and this, and it, it's very gratifying to see that, uh, you know, what's taken place, you know, it, what, what's, what's actually come about. For me, it's a great encouragement, and I think I feel it's really valuable. That I feel like I have a sense of ownership of this project um, and a commitment to see it through to success. I certainly feel glad that I've been a part of it. Um, you know, I've been able to show off to some of my friends who don't live in, uh, in Bristol who, you know, have said, oh, I wish I was a part of that. I'd like to be a part of that, you know, it would be a good thing for me as well, you know. So that's... Um it was a bit longer than I uh, remembered, but that's uh, why we're, we're doing the project. Um, and to summarise the goal, it's to increase literacy uh, amongst uh, blind people uh, because there's an overall decline in, in the use of Braille, um, which sort of cuts off access to books and, and other things. Um, and we're also hoping that through involving them with the development of it, we could help bring more of the blind community into the hack spaces. And as a, as a point of interest, one of the other goals is when the, the project is at a, a more finalized stage is to release the, the knowledge in, in, a, in a CERN based uh, open source hardware license. So moving on to some, some more uh, technical things. Uh, the Braille is on a 2.5 millimeter dot pitch. And then there are six pins or six bumps Per, uh, per cell. Um, th there's another grade of, of, of Braille that has eight pins, but we're working on six because it's mechanically easier to deal with. Um, the pages we're working on is an American standard of 40 cells per line, and then, uh, or 40 characters per line, uh, often referred to in Braille as cells, and then 13 lines per page. Uh, and the interesting thing there is you have uh, 3,840 individual dots to address and control for each page refresh. So the equivalent of turning over the page in your reading book or diary would involve the control of 3,840 dots. And um, the, the thing that crosses everybody's mind, especially if they have some electrical or technological background, is, is it can be done with magnets or solenoids. And I'm sure that, that 
any one of you in there uh, in the audience would, would be thinking much the same. Um, but however, magnets just don't work. Um, because by the time you've built your electromagnet down to a 2.5 millimeter pitch, so as they're sitting in rows 2.5 millimeters apart, you'll get magnetic cross torque. Um, the core uh, of the, the solenoid being the, the bit that is actuated by the magnetic force becomes so thin that the resultant force on it is, is, is nowhere near enough to, to, um, to take the force of somebody's fingertips going over the top. Um, so really the, the idea of using solenoids, even though it's the, the most obvious, is difficult. Um, the other thing is cost and things cost and lots of things cost so if you use an individual actuator per dot uh, not only is there a lot of them but however inexpensive they are having almost 4,000 of them is um, going to be prohibitively expensive to get something into the the front room of your average guy who um, who, who either needs it or who is interested in learning the medium of braille um, so our project has gone down the path of saying, well, can't we be more efficient with the use of actuators? Um, and, and can't we address more than one, one dot or, or one, uh, one bump with, with one actuator? And we've come down to a, a, what we think is a minimum, which is using uh, a matrix of actuators, uh, one up the side of the machine and one across the top to, to make a matrix of 16 row actuators and 40 column actuators, making a, a grand total of 56 actuators that would control individually the 384 bumps that would make a, bra a page of Braille. Um, and, and we've done that by uh, um, implementing and, and developing a cunning arrangement of gears and levers. Um, and, and to coin a phrase that, that we often band round is it's, it's using the sort of tried and tested Victorian um, horology clockwork mechanisms with the, the modern control of microprocessors. And so far we've had um, promising success with it. Um, the, other, uh, the other task is, is to make the, um, the machine repeatable. One of the ideologies of the whole project was to not only open up uh, literacy, um, Braille uh, to, to electronic devices uh, in, in the developed world, but also make it available for people in the developing world where I believe there's a higher instance of, of visual impairment. Um, and, and for this, we'd have to be able to make each me machine with accessible tooling such as laser cutters, which we now find in every hack space, CNC mills, which are almost an everyday thing, and 3D printing. Um, but but th through our path of, of producing the machine and the prototypes, uh, we discovered uh, various materials limitations, such as nothing is flat, um, which might sound obvious, and it might not if you've never needed anything to be flat. Um, we've come across problems of uh, laser cutters distorting thin material. If you have a very thin sheet and you put lots of holes in it, um, it then warps in the middle because it's distorted, been melted on the edges. Uh, you can make very, um, very complicated uh, acrylic shapes. Uh, you can uh, see some in some photographs uh, in a moment. However, acrylic uh, is fragile and it snaps. And if you get the wrong kind of solvent on it, it, it self-destructs in front of you. Um, the, the other obvious uh, material is acetal. It's a kind of a wonder milling machine, uh, millable uh, material. However, acetal bends, it is, it is soft uh, material. So if you make a precise machine out of acetal, it will no longer be precise in a day or two because you put it down irregularly and it slowly creep, crept and distorted out of shape. Um, the, the other engineering problems we've had are problems of, of miniaturization in that we'll test an idea 
uh, at, at five times scale so you can pick it up and handle it. Uh, but then when you miniaturize it, it gets smaller, yet the accuracy of your machine stays the same. So the actual um, uh, tolerance and scale are, are related. So as, as it gets smaller, the, the inaccuracy in, for instance, your laser cutter becomes more and more significant. And we've come across uh, various problems uh, with that as well. Um, the, the other approach we've made um, or, or is, is, is whenever we've tested a new idea, we've tested it on one braille cell with six pins. So you've got a lot of support around um, a, a very small area. But then when you increase that area to, um, to 40 cells, which is about a foot, you know, to, to, you know uh, 30 millimeters, then all of a sudden the, um, the force of resting a finger on the middle of a bar that's only three millimeters thick, for instance, is significant, and not only does it distort under the pressure of reading, but then any machine moving on, on this support rail uh, underneath is applying force al along the whole length, and then it bends, and we've ended up having to use, in, in the prototypes, ground carbide rods, uh, which, which are prohibitively expensive for, for the final machine, um, and, and that presents another engineering problem we're going to have to get, get over before we can go into mass production. Um, and, and the phrase at the bottom, uh, we've not been able to run tests of miniaturization uh, as we don't have the resources, um, is, is, a, is a combined problem of working on limited budget uh, with the turnaround cost of having um, a lot of things uh, rapidly pre prototyped, um, especially now as the machine has become so sensitive to tolerance that we've had to have um, parts for it made on some of the top um, the top 3D printers in the country um, and, and we just don't have the resources to say we'll have one of those then we'll have one slightly differently and then one slightly differently again we have to make an entire machine and almost guess that our intuitive uh, our calculations on why it went wrong the previous time were right um, so to highlight some of the prototypes we've been through is this is one of the earlier ones um, uh, some of you might recognize the, the simple stepper motors on the end as, as commonly available uh, hacker type eBay purchase sort of Chinese motors um, and then the whole machine at that time was made out of acrylic uh, which was fairly good it, it did the job um, but if, if it suffered any kind of shock or blow it would, it would break um, and also as, as we we strive to get the machine more repeatable and more accurate. We noticed that the laser cut edges were nowhere near as accurate as you would think. Um, and, and that was a bit of an eye opener to us all because we'd all made many things on laser cutters, um, you know, personal things, projects, uh, laser cut stuffs in our everyday life. But then when you start actually measuring it, the machines almost give you a different cut every day you go to them, despite nobody using it in between. Um, so it's things like that. So we'd make one prototype and we'd make a duplicate and they'd behave differently because they'd be cut out slightly differently. Um, uh, this particular machine um, uses brass pins and uh, solenoids. So the, the rows up, and up the side were controlled by stepper motors and then the, 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 the columns, for want of a better word, were controlled by uh, a solenoid actuation. Uh, this, this wasn't anywhere near our, uh, the, the figures I mentioned earlier for a number of actuators, but it was still, it was quite low. Uh, this is another prototype we made, uh, much bigger stepper motors, more like the ones you'd find on uh, uh, RepRap 3D printers, um, only these are slightly bigger. Uh, the other problem, uh, that this brought with, with the laser cut acrylic was um, stepper motors move in steps, which is uh, an audible sound. Then when you have a bunch of them in a machine that's sides are made from loosely clipped together or tightly cl clipped together acrylic sheets, you have a sounding board like a musical instrument and the thing 
would sit there and buzz and click and whir like some sort of uh, uh, late, late 80 sort of uh, rave uh, uh, booming box. It, it, was, it was quite comical, but n nothing you could actually ever give out to it on and say, here, this is a Braille machine, uh, because it would disrupt uh, anyone else in the room that, that might be with you. Um, one of the materials we moved on to was acetal because it's, it, it, it didn't break. We were having uh, breaking problems uh, with some of the smaller parts as they were just not durable. So we used laser cut acetal. Um, uh, and this was fantastic. Uh, however, it was, it was, apart from being slightly more expensive, it was bendy. And again, it was laser cut. Um, and the problem, as I mentioned before, with laser cuts is, is it's, it's not as accurate as you would think. And this is compounded by the fact that the delrin or the acetal melts as it's cut. Um, so, so when you're making um, gears out of acetal and, and um, interacting parts, is there's a, a greater level of, of unknown than you would like. Um, I put this on because I found it quite uh, a comical photo. Uh, we had to demonstrate this to some uh, sort of partners or colleagues in, in America, um, and on basically the evening before of the flight, uh, we were working with this prototype and someone said, how are you going to carry it through customs because you can't possibly put this on the whole of the plane? Uh, a uh, briefcase appeared out of nowhere and it was put in there like some, some child's uh, uh, comedy uh, spy film briefcase. Um, and we thought, what with the, the current state of, of things that this would, because this only flew earlier in the year, this one, we thought it would produce all manner of, of security problems, taking it to a demo, um, which was very important because that's the sort of forum and, and the, the, um, the, the place where we, 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 we can demonstrate our, our research and, and prototypes in order to gain more funding and credibility amongst the, uh, amongst the communities we're trying to support. And, uh, really, it, it produced no trouble at all in, in secure airport security and, and getting it on an airplane, which is a surprise for us. So we, we're not quite sure what they're looking for there. Um, uh, this is the first working prototype. We were able to give this to people, and they, they had it in their homes for a, a, few, uh, a few days, one guy a few weeks. And, and this, this has... Um, uh, Raspberry Pi in it that has uh, a select number of books that we've we've uh, converted the format on, um, um, and and there's there's various you see the buttons up and down each side the black buttons for selecting menu options. Um, however, unforeseen problems is we we developed this one for several months, put it in the box, tested it, gave it to people, tested it. It was fine because everyone treated it like it was worth. Uh, a fortune, like, like, like it was uh, some precious artifact. And then one day someone was walking with it and, and did not much more than a comedy trip taking it to someone for a demo and the pins bounced higher than they bounced before and rested uh, on another internal part of the mechanism and stayed there. Um, uh, I, on, on one occasion, well, on that occasion, we had to completely dismantle the machine, reset the pins, put them in with tweezers, uh, because I think there's about 500 on this particular machine. And once they're back in, assemble it, take it out to the next demo. And on the second time it did it, we decided that it wasn't worth the three days of disassembly and reassembly. So we had to move on to the next prototype and completely eradicate that as a, as a, um, a, a, a possible failure. For each idea we have, um, we, we've had to test it. Uh, unfortunately, this isn't as clear as it was, but we're testing a, a rack and motor uh, mechanism. So instead of solenoids, moving to more controllable motors. Um, and often when we, we produce things like this, is we set them going, uh, we put some kind of feedback on them, whether it be optical with a Raspberry Pi camera or merely contact switches, uh, and we leave them running for several days to prove to ourselves that the idea is, is, going, to, um, is going to be successful. Um, and again, this is one of many prototypes and mock-ups that we've had to make. 
the other way of testing ideas, again, this is looking at a rack and pinion idea, is you make something larger. This looks like it's about five scale. Um, and even with the best CAD images, there, there's nothing like making something and having it in your hands and poking it, prodding it, flexing it, and, and, and just seeing how it works when it moves and interacts with, with the rest of the mechanism. Um, these also proved invaluable because we demonstrate every couple of months to various uh, Brailis groups uh, that we've set up around the country. Um, and and it, it is, it's, it's almost empowering to give something like this out to a Braille audience and say, this is what we're talking about, this is what's on the screen. Um, and you can feel the gear and the pinion interact. And with, with, with not so much this one, but with other ones, this is how we make the dots rise up and down. Um, because without that, um, it, it's very difficult to explain to a visually impaired person what exactly it is you're talking about. Um, and this is another idea of, of gears and interaction. Um, um, and assembly is, is a separate problem. Is it's all very well designing these mechanisms, but the, the, the assembly of them is crucial. And I've put this one up because it's made of many laminates. The whole machine was made I, th I think there were four, or was it five, acetal laminate sheets for each braille cell, and then we wanted 40 of these in a row. And these were held in alignment with a, um, we actually used a bicycle spoke, it was the right diameter and they're, they're, they're hardened material, with bicycle spokes threaded through long ways. So if you needed to um, maintain or, or, or inspect a a portion in the middle of the machine, you had to slide these spokes out and then the machine promptly fell apart and you like some sort of crazy origami failure. Um, and again, you don't think about these things until you've built a machine and it's, um, it's uh, uh, ready to assemble and, and then you want to take it apart again and you know, it's uh, unforeseen problems. Um, uh, I've mentioned several times uh, the problems we've had with um, laser cutting, um, the fact is uh, some of the things we do are, are not suited for CNC milling. Um, so more recently, uh, about springtime this year, we started moving to 3D printed parts um, and, and it's, it's beyond the scope of any DIY 3D printer um, because of the tolerance and the accuracy we, we, we need. And we've ended up having the center of the machine now all 3D printed, um, which is a step away from having it made in the back of a hack space in a developing country. But um, our, our development and our learning proved that that was uh, an unachievable target. Um, and these particular 3D parts are produced on a machine that can, at, their, at its highest resolution, give uh, 16 micron layers and then an overall accuracy across the full area it works on of something like 0.3 millimeters which is about in about within what we can we can accept um, so so the project has gone from you know laser cut parts uh, through its range of materials and then onto 3d parts um, unfortunately I was going to bring a, a demo in I was going to bring a what we call a, a POC, a proof of concept machine, which is a, a piece of, of hardboard with circuit boards screwed onto it, and, and maybe three or four cells in the middle working. But we posted that to a, a researcher in America last week, and the, the actual demo is with some Brailis. I believe it, it's in Worcester, one of the schools in Worcester at the moment. So, so I couldn't bring that in. Um, and I, I didn't think it valid to bring in just a few bits. Um, so unfortunately, I have no physical demo um, uh, for that. Um, so, so the next stage after using 3D printed parts is, is then to, um, is, is then to uh, have them injection molded, which is the only way you can produce things of this accuracy with any kind of repeatability and, and cost uh, advantage, um, which is something we hope to move into next year. So that's about as far as I got uh, with 
with what I was going to talk about. So if anyone wants to ask any specific questions. Um, oh, yes. Ah, oh, right, your microphone, yeah. Cheers. Uh, what sort of production volumes are needed? Uh, how many do you expect to make? Um, at the moment, we're, we're making six working prototypes, which will be the first ones that will go out to people um, on, a, on a sort of beta test. And we, we've got uh, some of the Braille groups will share one. We've got schools and colleges. And I believe there's at least one going to American colleagues. But um, the, the overall goal, uh, which, which Ed, at the, in the short video I showed you at the beginning, is after, is thousands. He wants it to be mass-produced. And we've got the support of um, the uh, RNIB in this country. We've got um, sort of, uh, I think personal friends is the way, wrong way of putting it, but we're, we're, we're now on talking terms with their research guys. They're interesting, uh, interested in the project. And, and he has a similar interest from the equivalent of the RNIB in America. So it is, when it hits production, hopefully it will be mass produced. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Uh, two questions and then uh, something to mention. Um, so questions, what is your target price for this? And is the machine going to also have a Braille keyboard that is the, the typical uh, 10? The six. The, yeah. 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 Right. Um, the, the target price um, is, is very difficult to predict, but um, we're aiming for the, the target price to be about £440, so around the £500 mark, and that was for a full page, uh, which is why... Um, uh, did you miss the beginning? No, I, I saw the... All right, sorry. 16, um, yeah. 16 line by 40. Yeah, 16 line by 49, which, which is um, one of the, the major cost... Um, Benefits is, um, is is a reduced number of actuators, yet more moving parts. So you know the the, the idea is is to open up literacy uh, or, or Braille to to people who are just interested, as well as people who would depend on it. Um, there, there's uh, just talking about the keyboard. Um, is is we plan on having um, remote links or ra radio links, whether it be Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, network, or whatever, to other devices. So as for instance, you can have your text go straight to it. Um, which means it looks quite bulky at the moment, but hopefully it'll be laptop size. So as you can read your text, for instance, on a bus without the guy next to you having to listen in uh, on, on every occasion, if it's through a, a text-to-speech type thing. That's, um, have, you, have you compared to existing refresher braille's where they have like a one or two line display and uh, a, a, a nine yeah, key keyboard? Keyboard. Um, it's, it, it's, it's not a full it's, keyboard, it's the, the Braille. Yeah, it's, it's the Braille keyboard. It's, it's based on the Perkins machine, yeah. Um, it, it is something we talk about, but we're, we're so concentrating on making the display that um, almost a row of buttons on the front is a, is, is a technical triviality. It, it might be a huge, huge feature um, and, 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 and very useful, but from a development point of view, it's, it's something we can't focus on because we, we, we uh, you know, we, we, we have had a fair amount of money, but it's still limited for the development. And once it's on the machine, it's difficult to remove um, sort of feature theory. Once a feature's there, it's difficult to take away. And it's very easy to add it afterwards and go, ah, version two's got a keyboard. Um, and, um, and, you know, we'd have to, you know, uh, do that. So I hope that. Fair enough. Um, also, just separately, one thing to mention is I'm running crash courses in blind navigation, hopefully not too crash, uh, ad hoc. So I actually do use a cane. So if you would like to know how to do so, just come find me. It's on the schedule. Sure. Two questions. How much harder would it be to do 8-dot braille? And do you anticipate getting the power consumption down to the level where you can reasonably run it off batteries? At, at the moment, we're focusing on the one standard of Braille. I, I can't recall the, 
obviously the different grades of Braille, but at the moment there's not much um, interest in our, well, it's, it's not we're not interested, is at the moment we're focusing on six dot Braille. Um, and, um, sorry, what was your second question? The power consumption, yes. I mean, at, at the moment, the power cons consumption is quite high. It's, um, it's in the order of 120 watts. Uh, that's because we've got um, many stepper motors in it. Um, one of the things um, I didn't mention earlier is, is, is it's fantastically expensive to have motors made to a specification. So we've had to use motors that are readily available uh, because we need them to be cheap to fit our design budget as well as the overall budget of it being a cheap machine to, to produce uh, eventually. Um, that only leaves us mass-produced motors. So the, the main actuator motor in there is, is from, I believe, a CD draw. Um, and, and we've also used the, the, the motor that scans a, a floppy drive head. Um, so, 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 but but the, the target is battery-powered and... and a, a day's use is, is what we're aiming for, because of course it, cons it consumes no power once it's uh, got a display on it. it. It switches off internally. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I think we're probably going to have to wrap that up. I'm afraid, but if you, sure. if anyone does have any more questions, then I'm sure Russell will be available to answer them. Yeah, afterwards. I'm going to hang around the tent afterwards if you want to chat. So yeah. Cool. Okay. Uh, thank you very much again, Russell.